if nobody is standing by, Cece, I think we might as well begin. Okay, well, I'm going to mute everybody except you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> For the time being, I'll let you know when we need to open it up again, because I'm going to need some participation um, from everybody. Um, I do have a background here uh, in terms of 2,000 years of, of church history regarding uh, violence and nonviolence. Uh, it's a hopscotch, but it's, it hits some of the high points that I found. It begins with the earliest remembrance uh, of the early Christians who really did embrace Jesus' message of peace. In fact, up until the time of Constantine, the, the early church taught that, that Jesus forbade his followers to kill. Now, violence in our time has taken on many faces, obviously, with poverty and racism and sexism and politics and religion and the environment. But, but back then and, and well beyond, the issue of violence really had to do with killing. So that's pretty much what they talked about um, for most of the time up until the present. Christian texts before Constantine ever condoned military service. Uh, many say it explicitly that killing is wrong. Others specifically that Christians should not join the military. And Jesus teaching to love one's enemies is connected with the Christians being peaceful and ignorant of war. They don't turn on their TV sets. Ignorant of war. Um, killing is wrong opposed to attacking others in any form. The passage from Isaiah about uh, swords being beaten into plowshares is often repeated. And then in, in 312 AD, Constantine, the emperor of Rome, placed the Cairo symbol, which is the, the Christian symbol, on the shields of his military. And won a decisive military victory. And he saw that as a cause and effect. And within a year, he had then declared Christianity to be the state religion, which changed everything for Christians. They entered a dramatically new period. Specifically within a hundred years, only Christians could serve in the Roman army. It was limited to Christians alone. In the years after Constantine, leading Christian theologians, especially Ambrose, the uh, Bishop of Milan, and Augustine, the Bishop of, of Hippo, developed the basic framework for the just war tradition. Augustine wrote that war may be justified only if it cannot be avoided in defense of the state and its ends, its peace and justice, not revenge. Hear that. The end of war is peace and justice, not revenge. Can we think of any war that did not involve or be started by a need to revenge? So that in itself is quite restrictive. During the Middle Ages, Christian theologians such as Thomas Aquinas made arguments to reduce war. Some sought to greatly expand the categories of of people exempt from attack and others to limit the times in which military campaigns could be, could be conducted. For example, never on Sundays. But then the church itself launched the Crusades as holy wars willed by Christ to capture and free the Holy Land from centuries of Muslim control. Prominent church leaders instructed Christians to slaughter the infidels controlling the Holy Land. The large Protestant traditions of Lutheran, Calvinist, and Anglicans affirm and taught just war as Christian orthodoxy. It was elevated to a level of, of theological dominance. Just war became Christian orthodoxy. But the Anabaptists disagreed. And the Mennonites, the Quakers, the Amish, 
the Church of the Brethren and the Brethren in Christ went their own way. In, 19, in 1527, in the Shalithium Confession, Anabaptists made the bold statement that Christians should not carry weapons, but instead be armed with the armor of God. This effectively eliminated the possibility of Christians becoming soldiers or police officers. The Wesleyan Methodists were pacifists, along with other groups that were working to abolish slavery. And when the Civil War broke out, they took a political stand. We now have a, a religious group meddling in politics. They took a political stand and supported the North. David Lipskin, who was the editor of the Churches of Christ publication known as the Gospel Advocate, persisted in rejecting Christian participation in any war, despite threats on his life. The Churches of Christ remained largely pacifist until 1947, when the government threatened the editors of its magazine with arrest. Well, by the time of World War I, the Church of God had officially registered with the U.S. government, claiming exemption from the draft and involvement in war as inconsistent with our religious stands. Therefore, we have our first steps toward conscientious objector deferment. From the beginning of the 20th century, the Assemblies of God, which is today's largest Pentecostal denomination, has taken a strong pacifist position. Now, up to this point, the religious alternative to violence was pacifism not being violent, turning away from, walking away from, ignoring war, ignoring violence. But with Mohandas Gandhi, Martin Luther King, Rosa Parks, Dorothy Day, Nelson Mandela, and others, there arose a third possibility to actively oppose evil nonviolently. Gandhi's nonviolence defeated the British Empire. Dr. King's nonviolent civil rights movement changed American history. Solidarity's nonviolent campaign defied and conquered the British, the Polish communist dictatorship. When a million Filipino citizens dared to stand in front of the tanks, sent by President Marcos to crush them, the soldiers hesitated. One eyewitness reported that the soldiers did not have the heart to pull the triggers on civilians armed only with their convictions. In the publication, Why Civil Resistance Works, the authors examined 323 armed and unarmed insurrections from 1900 to 2006, and reported that nonviolent resistance campaigns were nearly twice as likely to achieve full or partial success as their violent counterparts. So we got up to 2006. Let's, let's bring this on home to where we are today and what I believe within the United Pres the Presbyterian Church USA. Um, is our most recent uh, stand on the issue of violence and nonviolence. In the 221st General Assembly that met in 2014, um, the Presbyterian Church USA sent to each presbytery five affirmations to help guide the preparation of a report on peacemaking. Following the vote at the 222nd General Assembly, which took place in 2016, fairly recently, by a vote of 322 to 169, the, I'm moving toward sharing here, so bear with me. The, uh, the commissioners, 
stood and affirmed out loud the following affirmations. First of all, we affirm that peacemaking is essential to our faith in God's reconciling work in Christ Jesus, whose love and justice challenge evil and hatred, and whose call gives our church a mission to present alternatives to violence. That's the stand of our church. Let that first sink in for a little bit. I need somebody willing to read the second affirmation. I'll read that, Bob. We confess that Thank we have else. sinned in participating in acts of violence, both structural and physical, or by our failure to respond to the acts and threats of violence with ministries of justice, healing, and reconciliation. I'll let that one sink in for a little bit also. Okay, a volunteer for the third affirmation. And by the way, before you start, um, overlook in this and the next one, any words that are in brackets, I'll explain those after you read it. So who will do number three for us? I will. We follow Jesus Christ, Prince of Peace and Reconciler, and reclaim the power of nonviolent love evident in his life and teaching, his healings and reversals of evil, his cross and resurrection. As we let that one sink in, I, I like that phrase, particularly reverses of evil. That's an action. Now, speaking of action, nonviolent communication or um, king in nonviolence makes a big issue out of the spelling of the word nonviolent. And as you can see here, for some reason, um, although it didn't appear in the first um, affirmations that were sent to the General Assembly, um, nonviolent became a hyphenated word. Um, in terms of understanding the difference between nonviolence and violence, nonviolent means not being violent, um, as in our review of the early church. The word without a hyphen, nonviolence together, is an active participation in reversing violence, um, the reversals of evil that we see listed here in number three. Okay, the fourth affirmation of the 222nd General Assembly. Who will read this for us? Uh, Bob, I have a question about the third one with that sick. Is that yours in the bracket or was that in the in the document? Uh, thank you, Bill. That's mine. Of the, anything in the bracket is mine. All right. And I'll be happy to read the next one. Sick simply means... Yeah, okay. Uh, okay. Learning thank from you. nonviolent learning from nonviolent struggles and counting the costs of war, we draw up on the traditions of just war, Christian pacifism, and just peacemaking and active nonviolence to cultivate moral imagination and discern God's redemptive work in history. We commit ourselves to studying and practicing nonviolent means of conflict resolution nonviolent methods for social change, and nonviolent opposition to war. This one's full of information as well. Just let that sink in for a bit. In the original five affirmations that were sent from the 221st General Assembly for review, along the way, um, that contained the phrase and active nonviolence, it was dropped in the, in the final um, list of affirmations um, because it was so specific, <coughs> such an important um, part of those 
original affirmations, it ju jumped out to me. And when it did not appear in the final version, that jumped out to me as well. Um, just peacemaking and, and active nonviolence. Active nonviolence is very Kingian. Um, and somewhere along the way, for whatever reasons that I don't know, that didn't make it to the final draft. So there are one more of the um, General Assembly affirmations, and I need one more person to read. I'll do it, Bob. Uh, Thank you. We place our faith, hope, and trust in God alone. We renounce violence as a means to further selfish national interests, to procure wealth or to dominate others. We will practice boldly the things that make for peace and look for the day when they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Thank you all. In a publication, an essay, a famous essay by Dr. King called Pilgrimage to Nonviolence. Let me stop this just for a moment, go back into it. Uh, Pilgrimage to Nonviolence, he, he, he outlines his, his background and the people from whom he received his inspiration, uh, a whole list of, of nonviolent proponents that pre preceded him. Um, reading a, a pilgrimage to nonviolence for me gave me a real appreciation for the depth of this man and the depth of his scholarship and the amount of research he did in coming to where he was. And it's in this publication that he first lists the um, six principles of nonviolence, um, which I want to review with you. And that's where we want to spend our time uh, primarily this morning. Son of a gun, I got back to where I wanted to be. For me, this is a miracle. Um, his original six were, were quite lengthy and they were boiled down by the, uh, by the Kingian nonviolence people, uh, basically the work of Dr. Uh, Bernard Lafayette Jr. and David C. Jansen, who put together the Kingian nonviolence curriculum. In doing my research, I found that there was a different set of the six principles, which goes beyond the one-liners um, and gives a little bit more depth into what he was going for which comes from the Martin Luther King Center for Nonviolent Social Change. And to give you an example of that, the King and Nonviolent Curriculum definitions, which is what I've been studying and what I've been using <coughs> um, as opposed as uh, compared with the Martin Luther King Center for Nonviolent Social Change. I'll put them both up. And, and as you can see, particularly in this first one, these are very similar. The beloved community is a framework for the future. Um, I don't want that one, do I? I want number one. There we go. Nonviolence is a way of life for courageous people. And in the Martin Luther King Center, it goes on to say, it is active nonviolence resistance to evil, which gives it a little bit more meat on the bones. We'll be coming back to all of these, but let's go through each of them individually. I need somebody please to read the second one. Both definitions. I'll read that. The beloved community is the framework for the future. Nonviolence seeks to win friendship and understanding. The end result of nonviolence is redemption and reconciliation. Okay. 
Third principal, someone else. Attack forces of evil, not persons doing evil. Nonviolence seeks to defeat injustice, not people. Nonviolence recognizes that evildoers are also victims. I particularly like that last line of the uh, of the expanded understanding of number three. Okay, somebody read number four. Accept suffering for the sake of the cause to achieve the goal. Nonviolence holds that suffering can educate and transform. Nonviolence willingly accepts the consequences to its acts. Okay, once again, we'll be coming back to each of these. Number five, who's up for this one? Avoid internal violence of the spirit as well as external physical violence. Nonviolence chooses love instead of hate. Nonviolence resists violence of the spirit as well as the body. Nonviolent, nonviolence love is active, not passive. Nonviolence love does not seek to the level of the hater. Love restores community and resists injustice. Nonviolence recognizes the fact that all life is interlinked. This is quite involved. Um, I'm guessing we might spend some time on this, along with all the others as well. But let's conclude with the with the sixth principle of nonviolence and one last reader here, if I can get one. The universe oh. is on the side of justice. Nonviolence believes that the universe is on the side of justice. The nonviolent resistor has deep faith that justice will eventually win. Okay, so there we have all six of both versions. We need to understand that none of these individually tell the whole story. They come together as a package. To observe any one of the six is in one way or another to involve the others as well. Um, they are somewhat revolutionary. And as the first one states, uh, it's a way of life for courageous people. We can talk about what that means. Um, and I can come back to this at any point. What I want to do here is to put into um, the chat room those six, yeah, there they are. Um, if you want to refer then back to the six principles, the one-liners, you can go to chat and take a look at them there. Um, and I can also put the slide back up um, on our screen if at some point we want to to review what we've already seen in writing. So given the fact that we've got six rather hmm, revolutionary points of view, which differ somewhat from um, the way in which um, we, re we re naturally respond to violence, um, I'd like to open this up and basically just have an, an open discussion for as long as, as we've got enough energy to talk about it, to choose any one of the six that particularly appeals to you or particularly challenges you or over which you might have some particular objection. Um, I mean, we could go in a variety of directions on each of these six. So please, anybody have any reactions to what we've seen? Well, Bob, I'll start off with that. without wanting to change the subject, really. You just a moment ago said something that catches my attention when you used the word naturally. If I heard you correctly, you said uh, something about the way we naturally respond to uh, situations. And it uh, rings a bell for me because I continue to wonder about nature versus nurture. I want to resist, maybe naively, the idea that we are naturally uh, more violent in our responses to things that happen to us. And I want to um, come closer to insisting that that's by nurture 
that we learn to be violent uh, rather than learning to be uh, nonviolent in our responses to things that seem to happen to us. And I wonder about that nature versus nurture dynamic. But as I said, I don't want to get off of the six principles too quickly either. No, I think you're really right into the six principles. And I misspoke when I said nature. Um, and I heard me say that. Uh, so, Bill, I, I appreciate that what you have said would have been my way of backing off from what I said and explaining from your point of view, really what we're saying. And actually this goes along with the, uh, with the idea of the sixth principle where um, the, the nature is, uh, our nature is bending toward nonviolence, that the arc of, non, uh, of justice is moving in the direction of nonviolence. And it assumes by faith that that is not our nature and, and that we're using a false perception of the world and, 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 vig and violence in instead of our natural nonviolence. So Bill, you said it better than I did. Thank you. Bob, I just wanted to bring up uh, the work that uh, many of us have done with the New Mexicans Prevent Gun Violence as a way of, of kind of backing up number one, nonviolence is a way of life for courageous people. You know, the people that work in this kind of an area, I mean, when you're dealing with people with guns, it is a very, um, uh, difficult situation knowing that they have the power to hurt and we have the power just simply to try to change people's minds or try to protect or try to um, you know move forward with reconciliation and I just wanted to um, just just uh, say it's also courageous because uh, you would think that people would say uh, hey good job you know thanks for working on gun issues and that's not the case in this country at all. Uh, you know, for uh, a dominant portion of our country, what we're doing, trying to be nonviolent with no hyphen in the middle of it, um, is, is something that uh, you have to take the barbs. You have to take some of, the, some of the accusations. And when I talk with people who have a different viewpoint, they always, almost always go back to the Second Amendment. That's all they do. They go back to the Second Amendment and they, <clears throat> without anyone knowing really well what those 27 words are really all about in the history of them. So I just wanted to bring up a, a group that's really working hard at trying to bring about some nonviolence in our world. And doing some very good work uh, legislatively and, uh, um, and in action and uh, turning uh, swords into plowshares literally. Um, in some of the reading that I did regarding that first uh, first principle, it says it's it's much easier to go into a violent situation knowing that you're carrying a firearm than it is uh, knowing that you're simply carrying a conviction. Um, so yeah, um, it is courageous people who are willing to put themselves into that position as you yourself have found because you've had your own personal pushback on the positions you, nonviolent positions you've taken. So that really does speak quite clearly to uh, principle number one. Are there others of the six that you might want to spend a little bit of time with? I'd like to look at the number three, the attack forces of evil, not persons doing evil. I think that's really hard to separate those two. And I'd like someone to elaborate a little bit on that phrase, forces of evil. Uh, thanks for that, Judy. I was thinking about that third one also. I, and when I hear that, I think about Nelson Mandela. And there certainly may be others, uh, but I think about uh, something that we've learned from the Martin Luther King Civil Rights Movement and then from Nelson Mandela is, is about that very idea. I agree that I think that's really difficult to do. Uh, it also reminds me, speaking of Nelson Mandela, reminds me of uh, what was it called the Commission uh, for Truth Telling in South Africa, where the idea was uh, to uh, allow people to come forward honestly and more openly with essentially their confessions uh, without the threat 
of incarceration or any kind of uh, punishment because of it. Was that called the Truth Commission? Is that what comes to mind? Anyway, I, I just think that's such an in incredible, important way to go uh, for informing our own approaches to dealing with people and issues, that the issues have a way of being even bigger than the people who were involved. And uh, while I think it's a, a difficult way to go, I think it becomes a very important way to go to say, you know, it, it's sort of a variation of love the sinner, but hate the sin, I guess. Uh, and I, I find that uh, really challenging. Yeah. Um, and you will remember in the expanded version of uh, principle three, it points out that uh, purveyors of violence are themselves victims of evil. Um, Kazuhaga, once again, the book that started all this for me, the healing um, resistance, um, radically different response to harm, um, points out that um, the phrase hurt people, hurt people, uh, he goes a step further from that. Uh, hurting people hurt people and are hurt in the process of being people herders. He's pointing out that you don't participate in violence without it having a reverse effect on you. And that people who are purveyors of violence are themselves caught in a web of violence which has poisoned their own system. So to attack them is to add more violence upon the violence that they already at some level are experiencing. Um, so going back to the, to the cause rather than the effects. Um, yes, it's difficult because here's this person right in front of us. Name any political person you can think of right now that you don't like. That's the person that you're, that you're attacking um, and not the cause, but it's, and once again, um, there's a certain amount of challenge involved in each of these six um, assertions, pr principles. Further, I always think of um, Amy Beale's family when I think of things addressed in number three, that, you know, you would just expect the opposite of, of what happened with them. And I think it was, their reaction was unexpected even to them, but, um, that's a beautiful story. Any, any time we see these stories of people actually clearly forgiving someone who has caused violence within their family, um, that speaks to this principle, uh, forgiving the, the perpetrator and still holding the, the cause accountable. We do hold accountable those who violate, uh, who harm us and we actually, you know, to hold accountable is to not allow people to continue to hurt themselves. So holding accountable is seen as a loving move. Um, if, if somebody is, is running with scissors and, and you hold them accountable and say, don't do that, that's a loving move. Although you're saying no, love oftentimes says no and makes people be responsible for their own activities, their own behavior. And that once again is a way of getting beyond the personality to the cause, the, uh, the, the organization or, or the institution behind what they're promoting. Yeah, we're doing well, what else? I'll throw in one that I particularly like. Um, and that's, that's uh, number five. Avoid internal violence of the spirit as well as external physical violence. We're talking basically about physical violence and the, the lack of response to physical violence. But this says we got to look out for ourselves and what we're facing because as we get together and agree with each other that we are opposing them, that our job is to stand in opposition to them, it's very difficult 
for us not to develop within our own selves a sense of, at the worst, hatred or rage toward our opponents. And so a part of nonviolence is monitoring your own internal mechanisms. Are you doing this out of a revenge, out of your own violent need, your own violent um, tendencies? Or are you able somehow nonviolently to look at the other person going back to three and their institution rather than the person? Um, I, I like anything that says that the issue is not always out there. It's me, it's how I approach it and how we really do need to, to monitor um, our level of, of love and nonviolence as we, as we participate in, in any of these actions. Any of the others? When I, when, I'm, uh, um, when I think of spiritual nonviolence, I also think of you know, forms of violence that aren't physical. I'm thinking of things like um, online bullying, people um, attacking other people with, with words and pictures and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's a, a kind of violent violence we need also to be wary of and not do and try to oppose. Violence is so pervasive in our school systems, our institutions, in our law enforcement. I, I have a background in law enforcement. I can tell you that uh, a lot of the training is watch out for the evildoer. Um, there's very little out there that uh, is designed for other than self-protection. And the whole issue of reforming or looking again at, at the police tactics and involving um, nonviolent approaches and involving people who are specialized in, in de-escalating circumstances uh, really needs to happen. Because even though the vast majority of people in law enforcement go in for the best of motives, um, you know, it isn't just a matter of the rotten apple. Sometimes it's the barrel that's rotten that, that turns good apples into bad. And, and too often um, the police institution is one of those. I'm still a member of the International Conference of Police Chaplains, and I still am out there trying to support them, but only where support can be justified. Uh, yeah, um, look at our movies. You know, I, I, I look at the, uh, just watch TV and any of the, any of the, um, the trailers or, or the promos for upcoming shows. I, 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 I challenge you to find any one of them that doesn't show a gun of some kind. Um, so even, you know, as, as we look at the, the best shows, the greatest show of the season, look at somebody carrying a gun. Um, it, it is, and here's where the natural part comes in, Bill. <laughs> it's almost natural to see all of these things happening around us and, and to fall victim to not even being aware, uh, to, to kind of blitzing out and, and taking as that's the way things are. Um, yes, Margaret. Um, all of that is a part of, of bullying and everything else as well. You can start to see the depth at which all of these six principles really do affect a way of life. It isn't just a matter of we get out there and we protest for this or that, but it's a way of thinking of beloved community where we start to involve all people within this large circle, which we take as being Beloved community, they may not know it, but our job is to help them understand it. And here are six principles to help us do that. Well, when we're talking about entertainment, I think about really young children who watch um, uh, cartoons on television. And I was appalled when my kids, I saw what my kids were watching and I, I compared that to what we have choices because there is PBS that's kind of the opposite of those cartoons that they may not have guns as much, but they're all the time just beating up on each other and, and, and you're supposed to laugh, I guess. They have re they've returned uh, 
the uh, the cartoons to Saturday morning television, um, and I, I've been watching them. I, I love Bugs Bunny. I love Daffy Duck. Uh, but uh, that's a confession. But uh, as I look at them from that point of view, Alice, I can see where the violence concern is. I mean, um, Tom and Jerry are always beating the snot out of each other uh, and doing terrible things to each other, um, as are Elmer Fudd and, uh, and, and Bugs Bunny. Yeah, that's a concern. But I and love them. And, and how Mr. Rogers really tried to change that. He did. And how important his voice was in that. And, and what a nice connection it is for Presbyterians. And also, just to note, you know, some of these TV shows, how bad they are. But one show that I never really appreciated when it was on it was MacGyver. Um, because MacGyver, uh, because the creator of that, Lise Lotoff, lives here in Santa Fe, has been part of our New Mexicans Prevent Gun Violence group and got to know him some. And his whole point was that MacGyver never, ever used a gun. He uh, always found creative ways to deal with situations. And that could have been violent situations, but he never used a gun in that. And he was proud of that, even as a foundation that's across the world that MacGyver is no more now with reruns across the world than it is here in, in the United States. And so he's been trying to, to lift up that idea. We don't need to use violence and guns to, to deal with our situation. So uh, pretty impressive that you wouldn't think MacGyver would bring that all out, but apparently you know it has. So I wanted to lift that up. Thank you. I had no idea that this was the case with MacGyver. I will watch his reruns. Um, you know, when we talk about what we can do with nonviolence, I go back to this book on nonviolent communication. Um, and if we do nothing else, uh, a book like this helps us to become aware of the very subtle things that we say or respond, the words with which we respond to what other people say that can turn them off and shut down communication. Uh, so nonviolent communication and that book in particular is one that I continue to hold up as being a very practical resource for the kinds of things we're discussing here. We've got just a few minutes left to add more to our discussion of the six principles. Well, maybe with a few minutes left, it's time for the altar call. Uh, <laughs> I, I was thinking back to the Presbyterian uh, principles of the General Assembly, those five things. As we're reading through those, it occurred to me that they sounded a bit like the vows that we take as uh, elders and clergy and uh, even parents at baptism and at our weddings. We're asked to respond, you know, the traditional question, and the answer is, I do. Uh, reading those affirmation statements, I just kind of, my head went to what often follows those questions of our vows is, will you? And, uh, or do you? And it made me wonder, you know, when we read those five affirmations, I think there are five, right? Five affirmations. Yes. Do we? Do, do, we where... in, do we individually, if we were asked those questions, could we say, I do? I do affirm this. I do affirm the next one. And this... uh, it leads me to right. sort of internalize some of that stuff and think, no, do I really? This is why I was impressed by the fact that they not only pass these affirmations, but the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the persons who were there were asked to stand up and affirm out loud these affirmations. And they're very clear. They're very clearly nonviolent and they're very clearly active oriented. And out of that has come our peacemaking missions uh, I've had some contact with them recently, um, and uh, Presbyterians have a tendency to, to make a lot of statements and, and not follow them up, um, and we'll just kind of stay in our heads and, and not move to action. But these are action statements that the commissioner stood and spoke. So it wasn't just a matter of saying, yeah, I vote for it or I vote against it. It's a matter of saying this, this I affirm. So I'm impressed with that. Do you know any reason why anyone voted against that, Bob? I mean, did you ever read anything about why that happened? Uh, I, yeah, I, I, I'm curious about that too. The vote was 
322 in favor and uh, 169 against. Um, and it may have, well, I, I don't want to make any judgments or, or guesses as to why somebody would have voted against, but I, I can't see doing that myself. But this was in 2016. Um, maybe things weren't quite as violent back then. Okay, well, we're coming to the end and to be faithful to, to your time and, and mine together, I very much appreciate the fact that you've, that you've come back um, uh, after the first attempt to try to lay out some of this stuff based on the, um, on, on the Healing Resistance book, which I still call to your attention and say, this, this is so much more than what we've been able to talk about. Um, that uh, it, it's a good resource and certainly worth a study later on. But between that and the nonviolent communication and all kinds of other resources out there, there is training going on. And from time to time, I'm going to, to ask uh, David to, to post some of the training that's available um, nationally. Um, I can do just so much, but I'm not a trainer. And um, I myself turn to the training that's available and I've taken quite a few of them and have, uh, have some more listed. Um, by the way, Harry um, put me on to John Deere, uh, other than the fact that he's got a really great riding tractor. Uh, this John Deere is uh, spelled D-E-A-R, and he's a, a, a priest who apparently was in Santa Fe for a long time from what Harry tells me, and has now moved to California. And he is going to be sponsoring a, um, a book study on Gandhi and Jesus, the saving power of nonviolence. Um, and you can look up John Deere, listen to some of his podcasts, they're really good. And uh, maybe sign up with me for this particular, um, for this particular um, training that's available. So any final words? Yes, I think you did an outstanding job, Bob. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. I appreciate your participation and um, what I hope will be your commitment to, to this lifestyle and the further study of, of what we're doing. So thank you. Thank Join you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you soon. Okay.